Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our live Q&A with Vivian Gornick. Vivian, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, glad to be so here. Before we get started, I just wanted to let everybody know, uh, you know, what, how we're going to run this. We're hoping that this is an audience-driven question and answer session. Uh, so we'd like you to ask questions. Uh, I I'll ask them for you, but you can post them. Uh, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A. Click on the Q&A and it will bring up a window. Uh, you can type your questions into the window and they will appear. Uh, and I will ask the questions uh, uh, of, uh, of Vivian as they come in. Um, we will not be using, we'll, I, I can't read two things at once. So please don't put your questions in chat. Please don't pretend to, you know, please don't do the virtual raise hand. I won't be answering questions that way. The only way I can ask your questions uh, is if they come in through uh, uh, the Q&A box. So if you want to start writing your questions in now, that would be great. And uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, get to as many of them as we can. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, and, uh, and so Vivian... It's great to see you again. Um, we, I feel like we've we've talked so much in the last couple of months. Um, Indeed. What are you are, are you working on anything uh, now that uh, we should know about? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you reading or rereading anything now that we should know? About? Oh, am I rereading anything now? Um, well, actually, uh, yes. Uh, in for some work, I mean, I am writing book reviews. Um, these days, and I've just actually finished writing a review of a biography of Elizabeth Hardwick. So I went back and reread Elizabeth Hardwick. Um, so that's the kind of rereading that I'm doing. And I'm about to start a piece on another writer uh, of many years ago, and I'll be rereading her work, Tess Schlesinger. Um, so in that sense, I'm rereading. Um, and having the same experience as with unfinished business, except that um, I'll be making different use, different kind of use out of the rereading. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not thinking of books in relation to each other as I did in unfinished business. Hmm. Okay, so we have some audience questions coming in. The first one is from Louisa. Uh, Vivian, you said you were not American, but a New Yorker. Could you speak more about what that means? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, well, that's kind of a, an inside joke, isn't it? I mean, um, New Yorkers um, famously, traditionally, feel that they are a country. Um, uh, and I mean, in the sense that um, I've lived in many parts of this country. And when I say a New Yorker, I mean a profoundly urban person more than anything else. Um, you know, most people live in small cities or towns or out in the country, all over the, the United States. It's, New York is really our only world capital. And uh, in that sense, I feel like I'm, um, that is a culture that I occupy with most ease rather than a uh, general sense. Of being um, when in New in America, I feel like I'm a New Yorker. When I'm abroad, I feel American. <laughs> uh, we have a question. Uh, hello, Vivian and Fadiman here. It was wonderful oh. to hear you. <laughs> oh, how nice to hear you. I mean, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you have any counsel for how college age readers might approach rereading. A 20 year old is very different from a 16 year old. Any thoughts on how they might reapproach a book they first read in high school? You know, I, I really don't. I feel so utterly unfamiliar with the culture of the young. I can't imagine what it's like to be inside a 20 year old's mind. It's ra so rare that I meet uh, young people, uh, in the, young readers in that way. Um, that I, and, and I am also very aware of how rare um, a person today is who's been reading since earliest childhood and who, for whom reading is um, 
the primary way of encountering the world rather than the internet and all the rest of it. Um, it, feel, it does feel very foreign to me uh, to be young today. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid, Anne, I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I bet you have more readily a better answer than I do. But it's nice to hear from you. <laughs> Okay, people, let's get some more questions going up in the thing. I'll ask some more of, uh, of Vivian as, as, as we, here we go. Uh, Allison, well, we just, we just did that one, uh, but I guess we can do it again. What are you reading right now? Um, right, right now? What am I yeah. reading right now? I'm reading The Unpossessed, an old novel by a writer named Tess Lessinger, whom I am going to write about. It's a novel of the 1930s. Um, and uh, Tess Schlesinger was, uh, had a mm, strong reputation in those years, and her stories are about to be republished, and I'm writing an introduction to that, that republication. I'm also about to start reading Louis Manon's new book, The Free World. I look forward to that. Um, and... Uh, let's see, what else am I reading? I've, I've got like 25 books on a shelf above my bed. And um, I'm so restless these days that I, I don't take the same one down every night. <laughs> um, I take another one down. Uh, but these are the books that are um, foremost right, right this minute for me. When you're reading a lot of different books at the same time, do you feel... Yeah like you need to finish them or are you okay with just leaving a book and never finishing it? No, rare. It's rare that I don't feel compelled to finish a book, no matter what. It's very rare. It's very rare um, that a book will uh, alienate me uh, so that I don't feel obliged. But I, I do, I feel it's like, like feeling obliged to eat all your spinach. Uh, you know, I, I can never leave the book on, on, um, I'm done. No, never. <laughs> uh, this is another question from Louisa. Did you feel that feminism limited you too much when you shifted back to male authors because literary history was mostly male? Do you feel this is changing? And feminism limited me? Uh, yes. I don't get that. Uh, in what way? Louisa, can you clarify perhaps uh, what you mean by ha ha what, when you're asking uh, how... Oh, feminism did I ever stop reading her? male writers? Did you feel feminism that... limited you too much when you shifted back to male authors? Um, I, I think maybe that's... I, ne I never part. stopped reading male writers. Hmm. Um, and in fact, it was rare during my most devoted years of feminism, um, of feminist reading, it was rare that I was ever even making the distinction between whether I was reading a male or a female writer. What changed was my interpretation. I began to read both men and women alike differently. I began to read from the perspective of someone who was suddenly beginning to understand that women were a, a subservient sect section of the population and of, and of history. Out of the way in which women figured as second-class citizens uh, everywhere and throughout everything and all the ways in that sense, male and female writers alike um, came under my scrutiny. I, I never did stop reading men in order to just read women, never. Um, so there was no shifting back. A uh, question from one of your uh, fellow prize recipients, Dion Brand. Uh, mm -hmm. Too big a question, I know, but what are you thinking about? What are some preliminary thoughts, perhaps, on what we've just lived in the past year and a half and how it might work its way into your writing? Well, that is an interesting question, again, for which I don't really have an answer. I am very aware of uh, all the time of... Yeah, here Hi, I Vivian. am. Hi, Vivian. Sorry. Uh, so sorry. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Glad, glad we sorry. got you back. Yeah. Right. All right. So we lost you just as you were about to start answering Dion's question about, uh, uh, you know, what's been going on in the, in the last year and a half. Yeah. 
um, as f I, I think I was stumbling my way towards uh, saying that like everybody else in the world, I have felt uh, really foggy headed. I mean, my life, I, you know, I've lived alone for many, many years. I live alone uh, in New York City, so I live alone in the midst of tremendous urban tumult. And that's my relationship to the world. You know, I'm in the house or I'm out in the street, back and forth, back and forth. Um, the pandemic did not make, has not made me live any less alone. Uh, I, my life has essentially not changed that much. Um, I never isolated myself completely. I saw somebody every single day. I went out every single day. Um, nevertheless, like, like everyone else, I feel foggy headed. I feel like I don't know where I am in the world half the time. Above all, I feel I can't concentrate well and that sort of scares me every now and then that I can't make my mind clear up uh, and I can't, um, my, you know, my, my thoughts, I can't read uh, with great concentration. Um, and then I'm very grateful that I'm a writer um, and that I, uh, because this is my work, I force myself to concentrate. I force my, I mean, writing forces me to clarify. And when that happens, I feel relieved. I feel relieved. Uh, but I'm constantly in that state of, of seeking a better concentration. Um, and that is, it's interesting that, that I see that's like my, um, my security blanket. That, that, that is, is what, I, what I turn to, what I depend on, what I look forward to. Um, and then it won't fail me. When I sit down to write or to read, and this is where I belong. <laughs> and the best thing I can do in the world is to be the best that I can be doing that. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but that's about it. Um, so we have a, a, a question from another Wyndham Campbell Prize recipient of the way back, uh, the very first year that we did the prize, uh, Adina Hoffman. Uh, oh, for the very God's first sake. nonfiction Hi. winner. <laughs> yes. Hello. How's your mother? <laughs> <laughs> I know her mother. <laughs> Adina yes. asks, can you talk about how it feels to reread yourself on its own terms or in relation to rereading other people? Yeah, yes, I, I guess I can. Um, the truth of the matter is sometimes I've been forced to reread what I really wrote in the old days when I was uh, at the Village Voice and on the barricades for radical feminism. Uh, and I go back and I read that stuff and I experience two things at once. I think a, a great deal of what I said then is, is still true. And I'm shocked at the lousy writing. <laughs> I'm shocked at the rhetoric um, uh, and, and the overwriting uh, at, at one and the same time. The writing is thin and it's overwritten. And the only thing that makes me laugh rather than cry is the knowledge that many years have passed and I've done better, <laughs> that, that I worked hard, that I, uh, at, I think at a pretty crucially early stage began to realize that writing was a long, long apprenticeship and that I, I had a, a lot to learn before I would write anything that would be decent in my own eyes. And I'm amazed, um, given my neurosis, uh, as well as anybody can do theirs, um, that I stuck with it. I'm always amazed by that. And when I read something that I think is good to this day, I, I feel gratified that I stuck with it to whatever degree I could. I certainly beat myself over the head enough in life for not having achieved what I think I should have achieved. But nevertheless, um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful that I stuck with, um, with writing and that now I most often can reread myself without flinching. Um, question from, oh gosh, we have so many good writers in the room today. Uh, this is from yeah. Emily Bernard. Uh, oh, Emily, Emily. Bernard. hello. And yes. uh, she says she was she was intrigued by what you were saying about storytelling in nonfiction and how you model this in your books. And 
So her question is, what does it take to become a storyteller as opposed to an author of nonfiction? Um, I don't quite understand that. Um, what does it take? Um, I think the most important thing that I learned early was that all writing was a matter of shaping a piece of experience. And the first, the first obligation was to figure out what the experience was and that there was one, that there was an emotional experience at the heart of what you were setting out to write. And then that you had the obligation to shape it. And that became the, um, that becomes uh, the origin of storytelling. You, when you realize that every, every single piece of writing in this sense is telling a story, that essentially it's a piece of emotional experience you have to isolate. Um, and that is the struggle to understand as writers always say, I didn't know what I was writing about until, until I did. Uh, you write and write and write. Um, and, you, you know, Tolstoy famously uh, said that he rewrote, he wrote and rewrote Anna Karenina three times before he realized it was her story. When he started to write, it was Vronsky. It was Count Vronsky whom he thought he was writing about. Uh, so it took three, three writes before he gave Anna central space and her due. Well, I feel it's the same way with anything um, that any of us sit down to write. If I, whatever I, whenever I think I have a subject for an essay, it's just some large and co-late uh, perception. Then the question just the struggle to isolate the core of the experience at the heart of what uh, this flash of feeling that I have, and then to shape it. This is what I mean by storytelling. Great. Uh, so the next question comes from uh, yet another great writer of nonfiction, uh, Michelle Orange. Um, a question about survival over 50 plus years of publishing. Have you gone yeah. through periods of <laughs> doubt about whether or how to continue writing? And if so, what has sustained you? No, I never went through periods of doubt about whether or not to go on writing uh, because I didn't think I knew how to do anything else. That's really the, the main thing. There were many, many moments when I felt an utter failure um, that I would, that I myself would not prevail and uh, that I would also uh, concomitantly that, you know, I would never get any, rec any recognition in the world, much less the recognition I thought I deserved. Um, and those are all m m many, many periods like that, which threw me into despair and which I felt like my fingers on the typewriter and then the computer were like bloody stumps on the typewriter. I couldn't imagine um, ever feeling at home again in, in this act. And yet I couldn't stop. I mean, that, that is one thing that is true and that I can't really account for. Uh, it never, it never occurred to me to stop. I didn't know what else to do. And, uh, and I wanted to do it too, too, too badly, too, too much, uh, to give it up. Um, so there were plenty of times when I thought, you know, you know like as if I was in the, in, in Russia, in the Soviet Russia, I'm writing for the draw. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not writing for anyone or anything in the world, but still I did it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be here otherwise. If I didn't get up every single morning of my life, make a cup of coffee and sit down at that desk, I would never have been a writer. Um, and that was, I'm, I, I do have to say through good times and bad. And I know plenty of uh, writers like myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Elizabeth Pergam asks, uh, could you tell us about the works of art hanging on the wall behind you and your thoughts on the relationship between <laughs> art and literature? <laughs> oh, oh, the stuff behind me. Yes, there's more. Um, these are three panels that I've had on my wall for many years, and they are the work 
of one of my oldest, oh yeah, one of my oldest and closest friends. In fact, they are the work of the man whom I call Leonard in The Odd Woman and the City. <laughs> that wasn't his real name, but this is his real work. Um, the man whom I call Leonard um, was an academic. He taught literature, he taught Shakespeare for 40 years. Um, and he, and he, he like me, or, uh, came from the Bronx, um, from the same working class Bronx. And he always really wanted to be a visual artist, but did not have the courage needed to pursue that life. Uh, so he became an academic and taught Shakespeare, which was a damn good substitute, I guess, for many years. And then when he retired, he began to produce art. And the three panels behind me are part of his early productions. If you were here in the apartment, you could see how good, how good they are. I mean, how good it feels looking at them. <laughs> um, what, uh, this person uh, didn't leave a name, but uh, what tools and methods have you found helpful with regard to recovering a practice of writing from a pandemic induced feeling of blankness or fogginess? Oh, well, in, in my case, um, I've been lucky enough to receive assignments which have grounded me. I have to say my own mind feels empty of inspiration. Um, uh, I, I have I've wandered the streets uh, of New York like everybody else for long periods of time without a thought in my head. <laughs> but luckily I, I have um, received a variety of assignments uh, which have kept me going. But it's, 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 it's been something. And, uh, and many, many people have felt uh, bereft as I presume perhaps you do too, um, of, um, of things filling your mind, of, of, uh, of, of stimulation, of animation. Um, that sense of, of utter stillness here is, Big. It's very big, inside and outside. So I don't know what people do who are not in the position that I'm in to receive work um, that helps you get through. Um, Miriam O'Neill asks, can you share a particular reread you've done in which the passage of time and new societal landscapes shifted your perspective on the reading? Didn't I do that already? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing since uh, unfinished business. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, uh, I, I haven't really uh, with any any particular. I haven't trained myself in any particular way to um, to reread anything new um, that is at odds with the changing society. So, sorry, I don't have much to say on that one. Um, and, and then one of our anonymous attendees asks, you know, again about rereading or, or, or just reading, um, you know, how, how does your practice of reading fit into your practice of writing? Are they, are they interrelated? You know, is there kind of simultaneity or is it really you, you absorb through one end and, 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 and express through another? I read unsystematically and I read constantly. I read, since the pandemic, I read more consistently than I ever have before in my life. I read four hours a day now. I mean, uh, every, every afternoon, like from about four o'clock on, uh, uh, for the next few hours, until seven or eight, uh, I read. I read unsystematically. I read whatever comes to hand. I read sometimes um, consciously to improve my mind. I'll read something demanding um, very often. I read things that I think are, are that are not demanding, still have some substance. Um, I, I cannot sit down to read trash. Um, uh, and I can't read genre novels or anything like that. Um, when I say undemanding, I still mean decent writing and something that has, has, has some, some import. Um, 
but what I love most uh, where, the sim- where the sentences are clear and simple. Clear and simple is the truth, as an academic once said. Um, uh, but every single day, I do feel obliged to read to some degree what Rosa Luxemburg called something serious. Um, and I have many books to, uh, to choose from. Uh, I make myself read for an hour or so um, uh, something that has uh, some intellectual difficulty. And then with great relief, I turn to novels or biography or memoir. Um, and I do that every single day. Um, and it's the only time I, I lie down on the bed. I have two cats. They lie down with me. They cuddle with me. And I read, and it's the only time of the, throughout this whole pandemic that I feel at peace uh, when I'm when I'm doing that. Um, so that's it. My relation to reading has, if anything, deepened. Um, and of course, always when you're reading, comes some idea for right for whatever it is you're writing at that at that given at any given moment. I, I- I'm going to ask a question because I think we're, we're the, the the audience is 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 running out of questions. So I just wanted to ask one. You know, you were talking about that kind of clarity that you strive for in in your writing, and you know, I think that's certainly one of the uh, you know, th- there's a clarity of of thought you know throughout your writing, both you know on the level of the the work as a whole, but also on on the sentence level as well. Like your your, your sentences are very you know. Their work to to so. arrive at that, and I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about you know how much you know how much revising and editing you do, like in order to achieve that clarity. Do do you find that that is a state of mind that you've arrived at that you can just write clearly at a certain moment, or or do you find no. yourself agonizing sentence to <laughs> sentence as you as you go? <laughs> yes. No, no, no. That clarity comes hard. That clarity is worked at. Um, I sweat blood and tears over many, many of those sentences. I watched uh, some of our recorded uh, session um, and uh, the part where I spoke about, where you uh, repeated a sentence that I had written uh, between, what you, what, between what one knows and what one doesn't know, et cetera. I worked hard <laughs> to clarify on that. I must have written it 50 times before it, it, it clarified for me. And um, it's always a shock every single time. I write something I think is clear as crystal. I read it the next day and I'm shocked by uh, how unclear it is or how it not doing what I thought it should do. And that is an experience that neither dies nor diminishes um, throughout the years. I mean, uh, I can feel that only I know a lot more about how to make it work now than I ever did when I was young or when all the years that I wrote. I, one resorts to rhetoric at not only out of the laziness of not struggling to um, find the right words, but the inability. Um, in those years, I wouldn't have been able to find any other words than the ones that I, that I used in those pieces in the Village Voice. Now I know a lot better and I know um, no matter what I actually let get published, I always know the degree to which I have worked to make this sentence do what it should do. So no, it never comes first. I think it was uh, Adrienne Rich wrote a remarkable little poem in which she said, maybe it was just a fragment of conversation, she said she learned a lot from Emily Dickinson. And what she learned was that there were states of being that one could hunt down, that one could pursue and find and hunt down, but it was never through the first words that came to mind. Wrap your head around that. And yeah, uh, yeah it was never through the first words that come to mind. Um, so that's that's a piece of great wisdom, hard-earned wisdom, hard-earned wisdom, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I mean, it's it's something I share, and I'm sure every writer does forever. Um, but anyway, no, no, no clarity ever ever just comes straight out of the bottle. 
Well, Vivian, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. And uh, we wish you the best of luck. Congratulations on winning the Wyndham Campbell Prize. And uh, as I always say to the, to the writers on our last night, don't spend it all in one place. Um, <laughs> okay, I will. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I hope Bye. you'll join us at the same time next week for uh, the next episode featuring uh, fiction writer and uh, visual artist Renee Gladman. Bye now.